cardium of a given patient, the estimated blood loss that the planned operation is associated with, and also the transfusion threshold that can be considered reasonable or tolerable in this individual patient. The first pillar can be defined as appropriate tolerance of anemia. This involves reconsidering the standard policy on anemia treatment. Some still use a transfusion trigger of a hematocrit of 30% or a hemoglobin level of 10 grams per deciliter for all patients. Thresholds that date back to an article by Adams and Lundy published in 1942. I am really convinced that there is no place for the magic 10 gram. Our experience with Jehovah's Witness has shown that, first of all, we uh, don't need the hemoglobin levels we assumed uh, were essential previously. But there should be no hard or fast rule or there should be no trigger. You can anesthetize patients for some procedures, depending upon the patient, as low as two or three grams if necessary. All experienced physicians stress the importance of maintaining normal volemia via simple volume replacement. With adequate volume, oxygen consumption is maintained over a wide range of hemoglobin levels. According to Professor van der Linden, the two main mechanisms responsible for the maintenance of adequate tissue oxygenation are an increase in cardiac output and an increase in tissue oxygen extraction. In the range of hematocrit values illustrated, the amount of oxygen extracted from the red blood cells of a non-anemic person is practically the same as that taken up from fewer red blood cells under acute normal volemic anemia. The first mechanism results from the decreased blood viscosity and sympathetic stimulation. The second mechanism results from a redistribution of blood flow to areas of high metabolic demand and from improved microcirculation. I am really convinced that a better knowledge of the mechanism allowing the maintenance of adequate tissue oxygenation during acute normovolemic anemia could decrease the risk of blood transfusion. What does experience with this principle alone reveal? I halved our transfusion rate by simply saying could we lower our triggers from 10 to 8 and just taking a little more control over the decision? That was very easy. Uh, that cost nothing. We do know that uh, we, we can allow patients uh, to, to, to equilibrate to relatively low hemoglobin levels without, uh, without blood transfusions. Obviously, it is important to plan ahead, especially if the patient, for religious or other reasons, refuses allogeneic blood. Preoperative planning requires a careful clinical assessment of the bleeding risks and a thorough laboratory screening, including standard hematological parameters. Based on the patient's condition, this may include other tests, such as a coagulation profile and tests for conditions contributing to anemia. Next, there is the need to calculate the safety zone or tolerable red blood cell loss for a particular patient throughout perioperative care. Here is how Professor Earnshaw explains his approach using the example of joint replacement. All you need is height and weight, male or female, initial hemoglobin, hematocrit, and you can immediately work out what the blood volume is. Next, either using your personal data, and anybody who's doing more than a few joint replacements should be able to go back and look what their typical loss is. So you, you want to know what loss there will be for that particular procedure. And the only other thing you need to know is how much can you tolerate? In other words, how low can you let this patient go? What if the expected RBC loss is greater than the tolerable? You can increase the, the blood loss that is tolerated by the patient by lo simply lowering the threshold of transfusion trigger. Or you can increase the, uh, the allowable blood loss by increasing the initial hematocrit of the patient and therefore have the patient start or go into the operation with a higher mass of red blood cells. Several of these proactive techniques can be grouped under the second pillar, optimizing RBC mass. We can expand 
the circulating red blood cell mass of the patients before the operation. And this can be achieved with uh, cheap hematinics like iron, folic acid, vitamin B12. For selected cases, recombinant erythropoietin, or EPO, combined with iron therapy can be used to treat anemia or to raise the pre-surgical hematocrit to within a range of 45 to 50 percent. EPO is normally started 10 to 21 days prior to surgery. EPO, illustrated by small particles, increases red cell production by affecting the survival, differentiation, and maturation of erythroid cells in the bone marrow. In the late erythroblastic stage, the nuclei are expelled. Finally, the erythrocytes are pushed into the bloodstream. Note the acceleration of red cell production with EPO. Besides the increase in RBC mass, under EPO treatment, usually one week is gained. Note the comparatively higher hematocrit rise under EPO therapy, according to one study. And uh, utilizing erythropoietin, we can increase uh, the circulating hemoglobin by one gram deciliter for each week of treatment. Recombinant human erythropoietin therapy is a tool that has also been shown to be effective as a blood conservation strategy. It's uh, been shown particularly in orthopedic procedures uh, in patients who are anemic. Um, and by that I mean whose initial hemoglobin is less than 13 or hematocrit is less than 39%. Now we use erythropoietin in, in very specific cases. Like, for instance, also the children of Jehovah's Witnesses, where we start to administer this medication four to six weeks before the operation. It's given twice a week with a dosage of 400 units per kilogram. If you combine the two principles, that is, increasing the preoperative hematocrit and decreasing the threshold for allogeneic blood transfusion, then you can allow an even larger blood loss to occur without the need for allogeneic blood transfusion. Now, this allowable blood loss can be further reduced, certainly, by surgical techniques or by anesthesiological techniques. Thus, even such complex procedures as spinal surgery and redo open heart surgery are routinely performed with an even wider safety zone afforded by the third pillar of a transfusion alternative protocol either by minimizing the bleeding or by recovering shed blood. Let's consider several important intraoperative techniques. Patient positioning is a simple cost-effective technique to reduce bleeding. Local venous pressure changes depending on the field's position relative to the heart and lower pressure directly correlates with blood saved. It's important to position the patient properly doing orthopedic surgery, in my experience, makes a big difference in spinal surgery. With pressure on the abdomen, and thus on the paravertebral veins, blood loss increases. With proper support, avoiding abdominal compression, blood loss decreases. Another option to decrease venous pressure in some surgeries is to use regional instead of general anesthesia, as shown here prior to a cesarean section. A further technique is the maintenance of normothermia, especially during long operations. So if a patient is cool or cold by one or two degrees temperature, you are seeing a loss in ability of platelets and coagulation factors to work. So it's essential that we keep the patients normothermic. Normothermia is extremely important. And therefore, our uh, operating theater temperature is 27 degrees in, in those major procedures which sometimes is hard for the surgeons, even for the anesthesiologists, but it's very good for the patient. More direct